Hi everyone, my name is Anastasia Lapatina and you're watching This Week in Ukraine, a video podcast from the Kyiv Independent. Every week I sit down with one of my newsroom colleagues to dive into Ukraine's most pressing issues. And this time we're talking about Russian domestic political turmoils following Wagner's failed mutiny attempt, including the arrest of Igor Girkin, the man who is behind some of the worst war crimes in Ukraine. I'm joined by the Kyiv Independent reporter Oleg Sukhov. Oleg, welcome back to the show. Thanks for inviting me. So we all remember, of course, what happened a month ago at the end of June when uh, Wagner mercenaries together with their founder, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, marched in Moscow, basically trying to take on Russia's military establishment. And while this attempt failed, it was very interesting to watch the fallout um, and especially thinking what would happen to those inside Wagner, those supporting Wagner. And for a while, not much was happening, actually. It was kind of weird. Um, there wasn't some overreaching punishment campaign from Putin. But now it seems like things are changing because we now have confirmed information and also unconfirmed media reports about certain arrests of quite important individuals inside Russia. And so one of them, and maybe the most important one, is uh, Igor Girkin. So tell us about who he is and why there are now photos of him in court and why that matters. Uh, the irony is that while Prigozhin staged uh, a mutiny against Putin, but he was not prosecuted. And he was allowed to <laughs> either go to Belarus or even stay in Russia because he's going back and forth between mm-hmm. Russia and Belarus. So he escaped punishment. But uh, the main, let's say, Russian imperialist who supported Putin during the rebellion uh, is Igor Girkin. Mm -hmm. Although he he was like a prominent critic of Putin during the rebellion, he supported him because he's against uh, mutinies, rebellions. Uh, But uh, ironically, it was not Prigozhin who was arrested, but Girkin. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the the reason uh, is a bit complicated, but uh, basically uh, Girkin uh, is a complicated personality because he uh, is quite uh, controversial and quite contradictory. He uh, uh, he's a Russian uh, imperialist and uh, supporter of the white uh, Russian movement, you know, the whites who fought in the civil war mm-hmm. uh, in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, he uh, he's a monarchist and he was the, the man basically responsible for launching Russia's war in the Donbass. Right. He even admitted that weirdly in an interview to a Russian media newspaper, I think. He yeah. said that if it wasn't for him, nothing would be stirred up. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's at least partially true. He said uh, explicitly that he pulled the trigger of the war in the Donbass and nothing would have happened uh, without him. Where does he actually work or where did he work? Well, uh, initially he worked uh, in the FSB, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, he uh, quit uh, around 2011. And so after that, he worked for Russian oligarch Malafeev. But in 2014, uh, he headed a group of of militants who seized uh, the the city of Slavyansk in the Mm -hmm. Donbass, in the Donetsk region. And this was the the beginning of uh, the real military conflict. Mm -hmm. Before that, there were only uh, some protests, uh, pro-Russian protests, uh, but uh, no military clashes. Mm -hmm. So it is true that he actually launched... Uh, with uh, the Kremlin's blessing, he launched this uh, uh, military conflict in the Donbass. Mm-hmm. Girkin uh, actually has been already convicted uh, of uh, war crimes because a, a Dutch court convicted him of involvement in uh, the downing of uh, MH17 uh, in 2014 over Ukraine. Uh, when, uh, almost, as far as I remember, almost, almost 300 people were killed. And uh, Girkin was allegedly the organizer of this uh, attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, So regardless of whether he did it intentionally or uh, they missed some um, alleged military target, but he was responsible for the downing of uh, MH17, according to the Dutch court. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Uh, and also, uh, Gilkin is being investigated by Ukrainian authorities mm-hmm. uh, for involvement in various crimes. And uh, obviously, Gilkin should be prosecuted for uh, taking part in Russia's uh, military aggression because he was uh, directly involved in it and actually started the aggression in Donbass. Uh, and also, uh, he, I guess uh, he should be prosecuted for involvement in extrajudicial executions when he was in charge in uh, Slovyansk. Mm-hmm. Uh, he basically uh, executed a lot of people for what he considered to be crimes, but it was basically was murder. Uh, and ironically, now, uh, uh, basically almost 10 years later, the man who was at that time uh, a supporter of the Kremlin, who was supported by the Kremlin, uh, now he has been uh, arrested and now he's in jail. And what has he been arrested for? So uh, the formal reason is uh, so-called extremism. Okay. So uh, <laughs> for any normal person, uh, extremism would mean, uh, you know, some, something like uh, support for Russia's aggression against Ukraine. <laughs> and right. uh, this is exactly what he's guilty of. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he, w- he was not arrested for that. Yeah. He was arrested for... <laughs> Uh, some obscure telegram posts, uh, formally, uh, that uh, basic in which he he uh, he said that you know the Russian leadership might uh, surrender Crimea. Okay. Uh, and but it was just it was just a formal excuse. In, in fact, uh, these telegram posts don't matter at all. It, it, uh, what matters is that uh, after 2014, um, he began criticizing Putin and the Kremlin. Uh, but uh, not not for uh, let's say not for normal reasons, mm-hmm. not for the reasons that uh, the liberal opposition criticizes mm-hmm. Putin, but uh, for the opposite reasons. He criticizes Putin because he, he thinks that Putin is too liberal, too pro-Western, and he's not going <laughs> okay. far enough That's in his war, in his war against Ukraine. Uh, so basically, si- since 2014. Uh, he has consistently uh, lambasted Putin for uh, being too soft on Ukraine. Before the full-scale invasion, actually, he criticized Putin for not launching a full-scale invasion. Okay. And after the, Putin launched the full-scale invasion, uh, for some uh, limited period, he suspended his criticism of Putin. Mm-hmm. But then he began to criticize him again mm-hmm. because he thought that Putin, uh, Putin's uh, invasion... Uh, is uh, very ineffective. Uh, mm-hmm. It's uh, and again that Putin is uh, making compromises uh, and he's not going far enough. He's not doing enough to defeat Ukraine. Mm-hmm. So this is the essence of his criticism that Putin is not uh, announcing uh, full-scale mobilization. That Putin is not mobilizing uh, the entire Russian society and the economy. That he's not uh, switching to uh, like full-scale uh, totalitarianism. And so th- this is what uh, mm-hmm. Gilkin wants. He wants Russia uh, to wage uh, like total war in Ukraine. Right. So okay. and this is why Putin uh, arrest- arrested him, uh, because, because of this criticism. But he is not the only guy on Telegram who posts stuff like that. There is a whole group of these warmongering Russian bloggers who, who read that. Is Girkin the first one to come under punishment like this? Uh, well, um, he's, he's, he's not the only one, uh, but he might be the most prominent mm-hmm. one. Uh, apart from Prigozhin, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but Prigozhin is a different matter yeah. because Prigozhin yeah. had uh, thousands of armed men at his disposal and Girkin doesn't. Okay. So this is the difference between them. So this is why Prigozhin was not arrested and Yurkin was. Uh, basically, uh, uh, there is a, a link between the, I think there is a link between the Prigozhin rebellion and uh, Girkin's arrest. Uh, it's because Putin um, wanted to show that he's powerful, that he's still strong mm-hmm. after Prigozhin's mutiny. And, and also uh, for him, uh, now any criticism implies that uh, there might be some coup, rebellion, right. uh, or revolution. So now uh, his tolerance for criticism uh, has decreased. Because basically before uh, the rebellion, Yukin had been allowed 
to criticize Putin just pu- like publicly. Prigozhin. Yeah. But after the rebellion, I think Putin feels more insecure and he thinks that any criticism can lead to something like mm-hmm. Prigozhin, Prigozhin's mutiny. So another figure who many thought was under threat after this whole failed coup attempt uh, is Russian General uh, Sergei Surovikin. Uh, Many saw him as a pro-Wagner, anti-Russian establishment general. So tell us about him and his fate, because there are some reports that are unconfirmed. It's it's kind of unclear what's happening. In 2022, Surovikin was actually in charge of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine for some period. Mm-hmm. And at that time, he, he actually closely cooperated with Wagner and Prigozhin. And uh, so there, there is a lot of speculation that they have some kind of relationship and they, uh, they are sort of allies. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, actually, when the rebellion began, he called on Prigozhin and on Wagner to stop the rebellion. So okay. actually, it's, it's also kind of uh, speculative. Uh, it's not clear whether Surovikin was really an ally of Prigozhin at, at the time of the rebellion or just the Kremlin is paranoid. It's, it's mm-hmm. not clear. Okay. So, uh, but I think, yeah, I think this uh, fear of uh, uh, Prigozhin's alleged allies and this paranoia contributed to uh, these recent developments with Surovikin, because there were media reports that uh, allegedly Surovikin was arrested, but there was no official confirmation. And uh, there were other reports that he was allegedly just interrogated and uh, released. And some member of the Russian parliament said that he's just on vacation. So <laughs> it's not clear what his fate is, but something shady is, is going on. <laughs> Uh, we just not, don't know exactly what, uh, uh, but uh, there is some kind of uh, crackdown against uh, Surovikin, uh, yeah, exactly because of Prigozhin's rebellion. What could be the reason for the Kremlin to hide some repercussions against him? And why wouldn't they make it public, like with Girkin, that like, yeah, Surovikin was allegedly supporting Wagner and we are sending him to prison, he's a traitor. Why, would, why, why is it so quiet? Well, uh, it's probably it's just uh, the Kremlin style. It just uh, does it uh, this way uh, pretty often, actually. Uh, actually to to pretend to be stable? Uh, probably, yeah. Pro- probably just to, to ma- maintain this kind of illusion of stability mm-hmm. and that uh, basically uh, just to prevent people from knowing too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were cases like this before when people were arrested, but there were, there were no... Uh, official announcements and so it, it happens quite a lot okay so there is Girkin um, and there is potentially Surovikin who've seen some repercussions but you've already mentioned that Prigozhin who was actually the man in charge of this crazy rebellion he hasn't really seen any consequences so what's what's happening with him where is he he was expected to be in Belarus as a result of this deal that Lukashenko brokered do we know is he there um, what's happening so uh, Prigozhin and Wagner mercenaries were expected to go to Belarus. But in fact, uh, now Prigozhin is going back and forth between Russia and, and uh, Belarus. He's free to go around uh, uh, Russia, which is quite uh, strange, given that right. he staged a mutiny against Putin. It is. But this is uh, very, very Kafkaesque and surreal. But this is yeah, what modern Russia is. So this is Putin's style, I think. Uh, so uh, I, I think if, if uh, Putin were actually Stalin, probably Prigozhin w- would be uh, executed on the spot. But Put- Putin's uh, dictatorial style is a bit different. <laughs> but actually, um, he's also trying to uh, register his uh, company or companies in, in Belarus instead okay. of Russia. So and uh, Wagner mercenaries have been transferred, at least some of the Wagner mercenaries have been transferred to a military camp in uh, Belarus. Do they still operate inside Russia? As far as I know, they, they, they're not uh, operating now inside Russia. They just, uh, if, if there are some Wagner mercenaries inside Russia, uh, they are not functioning as some kind of, in some kind of official capacity or mm-hmm. as, uh, they, they're not serving in the army. They're not, mm-hmm. as far as I know. Okay. So now, uh, uh, the question is, what, what will happen to uh, Wagner troops uh, and, uh, in Belarus? 
uh, and for what exactly they will be used. Uh, uh, there, there is a lot of speculation and, you know, Kremlin pr propaganda and Lukashenko uh, are trying to hint that actually the Wagner mercenaries uh, may be used to attack Poland, which is, I think, uh, quite ridiculous <laughs> because uh, there are like several thousand maybe at, uh, at most uh, Wagner mercenaries against the NATO country against the NATO <laughs> country so uh, and uh, it's just uh, absolutely uh, preposterous and uh, impossible so it just it might be some kind of like uh, uh, you know uh, some kind of attempt to scare to intimidate the West but it's uh, it's uh, it's failure even as an attempt to scare the West I think uh, but there is also speculation that uh, they might be used against Ukraine, which is also du dubious. Uh, it's not clear whether it's possible uh, because the Kremlin doesn't trust uh, Wagner mercenaries anymore. So uh, uh, they might uh, turn their weapons against uh, Russian troops again. So uh, I don't know if it's possible to use Wagner troops in Ukraine again. So Wagner for the Kremlin. pretty much has become insignificant. I don't know if it's become insignificant. It might, it might still operate in Africa or right. in some other countries. Yeah. And uh, there is also speculation that they might be used, uh, you know, for some new mutiny or rebellion <laughs> against Putin, which, is, which would be quite absurd because if, if Putin does not prepare for a second uh, rebellion attempt, uh, it will be absurd. There were also news that uh, Prigozhin shut down his um, troll farm, right? The the offices in Saint Petersburg. Those were the same trolls that mm. operated for the Kremlin and uh, meddled in 2016 U.S. elections. So ah, that's yeah. pretty big. Well, uh, yeah, but uh, I think they were not very significant, uh, you know, uh, recently because mm -hmm. they they were used. To, uh, yeah, they, they were used by the Kremlin before, but now, like, when Prigozhin is a persona non grata for the Kremlin, I don't think they, they, they have uh, any use for the Kremlin. So, so just Prigozhin is shutting down his business in Russia, and that's just part of this uh, shutdown. Mm -hmm. When international outlets were writing uh, about these arrests, uh, people like Girkin, people like Surovikin, they say things like, Putin critic or Putin dissenter had spoken out or was arrested. And Ukrainians don't really like that language um, because that also kind of leaves the entire Russian opposition in, in a very awkward position where part of them are the Navalny camp who have some questionable past and some questionable political stances on Crimea and such. And then a part of them are outright war criminals. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. Are these people like Girkin and let's forget Survikin for now, let's say Girkin and other Telegram bloggers who scream that Putin isn't killing Ukrainians efficiently enough? Can we consider them Russian opposition? And how does that fit with like the typical liberal opposition that the West knows so well? So basically, in this case, uh, it's uh, more complicated than just uh, any kind of propaganda can uh, can present it because mm -hmm. basically, some people want to create the impression that uh, the whole Russian opposition uh, consists of like fascists like, like Girkin, which is not true because mm -hmm. there are uh, liberal people, there are people who consistently uh, oppose uh, the war against Ukraine and uh, support sanctions against Russia, etc. Uh, so and Navalny actually, uh, he was uh, criticized uh, in Ukraine because he said that uh, he didn't uh, explicitly say, say that Crimea should be given back uh, to Ukraine, uh, although he actually said that Crimea is uh, legally de jure Ukrainian, but it's, it would be difficult to give it back because, for, mm -hmm. because of some, uh, let's say, political reasons. He's but, now changed his yeah, stance, uh, I think. But when, yeah, yeah uh, after the Russian invasion began, he changed uh, his position. And now, basically, uh, uh, his position is, I think, 100% uh, correct. Uh, in uh, basically, if if you assess it uh, according to the Ukrainian position, uh, although he he's still being criticized for for his statements in the past, mm -hmm. but there are, pe there are also people uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the Russian opposition who who've never said something like this. 
uh, about Crimea, you know, like Kaspara, for example. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but there is also another part of the Russian opposition, which is uh, anti-liberal, which is imperialist and which criticizes Putin not for <laughs> being a dictator, but for not uh, being enough of a dictator, not for starting the war against Ukraine, but for actually uh, not going um, far enough uh, in his effort to destroy Ukraine. So this is uh, the fascist opposition, I would call it. So Girkin was uh, one of the most prominent members of this opposition. These two so, parts um, of opposition don't, don't seem to engage much. I mean, the latest scandal involved Navalny saying that Girkin was a political prisoner. Another mm-hmm. reason why people here in Ukraine got quite mad at him because, you know, there are so many political prisoners he could have written a tweet about, but he chose Girkin, who is a war criminal. Um, but basically, uh, but there is no uh, there is no contradiction here because a war criminal can also be a political prisoner. Right. So I basically, think. and actually Navalny uh, stated quite clear that he, he was convicted by a Dutch court uh, for downing MH17. And that was a real crime. It was a yeah. real trial. And this yeah. is what Navalny said. But at the same time, mm-hmm. uh, he was jailed by Putin just because, uh, because of his criticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, his position is that, yeah, he should be jailed, but he should be jailed for real crimes, <laughs> right. not, not for being a critic of Putin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, people don't like nuance. They just like, you know, white and black statements. And that's why they, uh, if they hate Navalny already, of course they will, uh, yeah. they will hate him for that statement too. Uh, so, um, but actually, if you think about it, so if uh, critics of Navalny in this specific case, if they say that uh, basically Navalny is 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 a is an idiot or is uh, uh, basic is wrong just mm-hmm. because he said that Girkin is a political prisoner, but at the same time, the, Navalny can accuse them of siding with Putin. So in this case, there is a choice between siding with Putin right. or siding with Girkin, which is not not a good choice. I, I agree that it's very difficult and murky. Um, I think why the reason why people get so mad is not necessarily because Navalny was factually, emotions aside, incorrect it's more of like the context and the timing and that there are so many political prisoners that he could have been tweeting about including in ukraine but you know he chose to make a whole thread about girkin who is just a terrible terrible person um it just highlights uh this kind of very peculiar situation in which the russian opposition finds itself in uh that it's so drastically divided ideologically um but you've already mentioned that putin is obviously fearing looking weak. And um, many experts have called Putin, you know, things like paralyzed and confused and not knowing what to do um, after the Wagner rebellion, obviously weakened. Uh, How do you think everything that has been happening, his seeming attempt to crack down on his opposition, let's say, um, where does that all leave Putin? How did his image change? So uh, it is true that Putin looked uh, very weak uh, when he made his uh, statements during the rebellion. And then first he made the speech that, uh, you know, Pr- that Prigozhin uh, is a criminal, should be punished. But then he made a deal with him and let him go, which looked very absurd. And uh, the fact that uh, a person who launched a rebellion against Putin was released is just like basically a sign that, you know, um, you can you can rebel against Putin and that's okay. So it's yeah. it, it is perceived as a sign of weakness. But on the other hand, uh, there is also a lot of wishful thinking involved. That people actually want to think that Putin's regime is actually weaker than it actually is. A lot of people want to want, want Putin's regime to collapse, and they uh, so that they actually. Uh, let's say um, they create this impression that it's super weak uh, just because of their emotions. But so far, Putin's regime has survived. It has survived. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of people, when, when a lot of people predicted that it would collapse because of the invasion, it didn't collapse. A lot of people predicted that it would collapse because of the economic situation, it didn't collapse. Because of the sanctions, the same. 
And now a lot of people predicted that it would collapse because of Prigozhin's rebellion and it's not collapsing, at least now. So uh, there is a lot of wishful thinking. Think. So the regime may be weak, but it's not weak to a point where it's really um, threatening the entire structure. Yeah, I mean, everything, uh, everything is possible, but uh, there is not enough evidence to state that, you know, uh, this rebellion is a sign that, you know, Putin's regime will collapse, let's say, in a month or in a year or even mm -hmm. in two years. Mm -hmm. It's just very speculative. And how does all of this affect Ukraine, if at all? Does it have an effect on how the war is going, um, how, how the Russian war effort is going? Well, I think uh, actually the impact on Ukraine is minimal. I think it's more of a consequence of uh, the conflict in Ukraine right. because basically it's uh, uh, the fact that Putin launched this war uh, led to this turmoil. It led to uh, Prigozhin's mutiny. Uh, it led to uh, Prigozhin's rhetoric when Prigozhin actually accused Putin of the same thing that, you know, uh, Girkin accused Putin of. It's like basically that the invasion is failing, that the army, the military is absolutely ineffective, that uh, uh, it's impossible for Russia to launch a real offensive. Basically, uh, I would say that this rebellion was sort of an indicator that uh, the, situ the military situation for Russia is not as good as it hoped. Uh, but uh, in terms of its uh, actual impact, a lot of Ukrainians hope that uh, this turmoil in Russia would actually weaken uh, you know, Russia on the front line, but it didn't happen, unfortunately. So basically, uh, there was almost no influence on the situation on the front, and uh, the Ukrainian offensive uh, did not ch change, it did not become uh, stronger because of that. We're now going to be moving to questions from our community members, but right before we do that, I want to take a moment to remind you guys that The Kill Independent just released its very first documentary film. Uh, it was produced by our reporter Olesi Bida, who works in our newly created war crimes investigative unit. The movie Uprooted uh, is an investigative documentary that dives into stories of Ukrainian children who were abducted by Russia from Mariupol. These children were separated from their families, illegally deported, um, and uh, the movie shows everything they went through and also how their families tried to get them back from Russia and the Russian regime. Uh, it is now available on YouTube. It premiered just last week, so make sure to check it out. And as always... Also, so make sure to support us and become a member of our community. We have released our very own uh, community membership system. So you can support us directly by going on our website at coindependent.com slash membership. There are many different ways to support us. There is one-time donation. There are several tiers of monthly membership. Uh, you get really cool perks for as little as $5 a month. Uh, you get access to exclusive events like discussions with editors. You also get um, a chance to join a Discord server that has the entire newsroom in it and also all of the community members where we can chat, engage in discussions. And you also get to send questions before every single podcast episode. Uh, we do a call out for questions and we try to incorporate as many questions of yours as we can. So now moving on to the questions. One uh, supporter was asking, uh, or rather saying that they're still wondering uh, whether everything that happened with Wagner was as straightforward as it seemed on the surface, because to them, the whole attempted coup seemed very orchestrated. This is a very common view, I'd say, uh, at least on Twitter and social media and among people who are interested in this. Um, what would you say to that? Do you, do you think there is any reason to believe that the whole Wagner mutiny was somehow an orchestrated Putin orchestrated rebellion? So, I mean, uh, the problem with uh, conspiracy theories is that uh, they're too complicated to actually implement. So basically, you would have to assume that Putin staged this whole uh, show with uh, Wagner columns uh, moving, uh, you know, towards Moscow, seizing uh, the city of Rostov. And, you know, uh, this is like uh, a lot of theatrics was involved. So <laughs> and it, it just, right. it's just like theater on such a huge scale that uh, I think it's absolutely impossible. It's just uh, 
it would imply that uh, Putin is absolutely ma- mad uh, if if he actually uh, wants to create this this sort of uh, conspiracy, and it's not even clear for what purpose. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> what, what, if if there was a conspiracy, uh, you know, in this Wagner rebellion, and, and if it was not a real rebellion, then for what purpose? I don't see any purpose in the, for that. Some people were saying that it's to see who supports uh, Wagner and Prigozhin and kind of what a position <laughs> pops up uh, and then to get rid of them. That was one of the speculative reasons. And then they, and then they didn't get, get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get rid of Prigozhin. So and Prigozhin too. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Another question that we got was about Wagner's security contract. So the supporters basically saying that um, they're now, Wagner is no longer a part of uh, Russian military operations, but did they have they regained control of their security contracts? I assume the person means their operations in Africa and Middle East and beyond. Uh, no, nobody knows what, what's going on with uh, Wagner operations in Africa, so it's still still a question. Uh, so as far as I know, like they're not involved in Russia anymore. Mm-hmm. They are involved in Belarus, but nobody knows in what capacity and what will happen to them there. Mm-hmm. And it's not also unclear what will happen to, to Wagner in uh, Africa. Okay. Well, or there is speculation that uh, they might be replaced with uh, like some other Russian mercenaries. So in, uh, I've read some articles about uh, African governments saying that they have some kind of relationship with Russia. And if Wagner is not involved, then someone else from Russia will be involved. Okay. Well, Oleg, thank you so much. It was really interesting as always. Thank you. Also this week, global wheat and corn prices have been rising sharply following Russian attacks on Ukrainian port infrastructure in Odessa Oblast. Russia has attacked ports and wheat storage facilities in the city of Odessa as well as Odessa Oblast several times after pulling out of the Black Sea grain deal. Ukraine's foreign minister Dmitro Kuleba said that the much-awaited F-16 jet could enable Ukraine to protect grain shipping lanes in the Black Sea following the collapse of the grain deal. But at the same time, Politico reported, citing anonymous U.S. government sources, that Western states still haven't agreed on a training plan for Ukrainian pilots, despite hopes that the F-16 training could begin this summer. And Ukraine's military reported advancing up to 1.4 kilometers in the direction of Berdyansk in the south of the country, as well as having success in some offensive operations around Bakhmut. You can find our show on YouTube and all audio platforms every Friday morning. If you like this episode, please subscribe to us and like our content wherever you're listening to this podcast. Please make sure to support us by becoming a community member at coindependent.com slash membership and follow us on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Also, make sure to check out our multimedia project, Ukraine's True History, which is a series of articles and videos here on YouTube that aim to debunk Russian myths that distort Ukrainian history and Russian propaganda about Ukrainian history. We'll be back next week. Thank you for watching.